Hello YouTube, we just had a great interview with Andrew Brenton from Turtle Creek Asset Management in Toronto. And we talked how he got the return of 22% over the last years of the inception of his uh, fund and how his process works. So if you like the content, subscribe and leave a comment. Thank you. Hi Andrew, welcome on our YouTube channel. It's nice to have you here. Uh, here. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, how did you come into the industry and how did you, or how and when did you identify, identify yourself as a value investor? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, um, my career path, as is my two partners who founded Turtle Creek with me, you know, maybe it's a little different as an investor path. Uh, we were investment bankers, mergers and acquisitions specialists. I actually worked on a lot of transactions in Europe. Uh, this is back when I was much younger in my career. And then um, the middle part of my career, I had the opportunity to set up from scratch and run, uh, build a private equity fund for one of the large Canadian banks. And I did that in the 1990s and my two partners who uh, are with me at Turtle Creek um, uh, were also, I, I had them join me in that phase of our career. Um, so I never really thought of myself as a value investor. I d hadn't really read much in the way of investing. Um, so it was only years into running Turtle Creek and, and investing that I realized, okay, then of course the only way I think to invest is think about the present value of cash flows, the fundamental value of a business. It just didn't occur to me that there was any other way to invest. So. I guess I'm a value investor without having known what it, what it meant at the beginning. Interesting. What is your track record at uh, Turtle Creek since you started to invest there? The track record's quite strong. I mean, we've earned better than 20% compounded returns. Um, we've grown a dollar over 21 years to today around $65. But I want to stress, and this is one of the issues that we have when we meet new investors, we never set out to make those returns. We would never represent that we could make those returns going forward. Um, our approach is uh, to really try to minimize risk rather than earn high returns. But it, it is a, um, a decent track record over many different market environments. Could you maybe share with us your views on portfolio concentration and risk? Sure. So, I mean, I think the biggest risk factor uh, is, is owning things that are too highly valued, too highly priced. Um, and so we don't have any formal limits on our portfolio weightings. Um, what we do is we require uh, the portfolio to have at least 25 holdings. And so by doing that, um, it, it, that, that is, a, I guess, in a sense, a risk mitigator in case you're wrong on one of your companies. Um, but then within that 25 or more holdings, we, uh, we have no, as I said, no formal caps. We do drive incremental money to things that we think are more and more out of favor. And that does mean that at times a weighting could be more than 10% of the portfolio. Today, for example, our largest holding is 10.5%. Um, we've never actually in 21 years um, been in a situation where we got to buy more of a company as it was getting cheaper and cheaper in price such that it was more than 10%. So I'd like it to happen. Maybe someday it will happen. The company that I just referenced that's 10.5%, we were buying it uh, recently at lower and lower prices made it probably around 85 to 9% and now um, as it happens the price has risen and and that's how it's gotten to be 10.5%. But from a risk managing standpoint, it's now that we will, if it continues to rise in price, we will now begin to trim the position. And uh, if it really rises in price, it'll become a much smaller percentage. And, that's, and that is the approach we're applying across the board with all of our holdings. Would you call yourself a buy and hold investor? So uh, w the way I would describe it is we, uh, we have a buy and hold intention unless the prices change. And so if you think of our prior career as private equity investors, we were by definition a buy and hold. We invested and had control positions in private companies. Um, 
So we apply that same thinking to the public companies that we own in Turtle Creek. Uh, but so if prices don't change, we don't do anything. But one of the great features of the public market and something that really drew us to the public market is prices change and often they change dramatically. And we love that as a feature of the, of the public market. Yeah, let's change the topic a bit to economic modes. Um, do you have, um, um, in your top holdings, could you maybe name two or three economic modes which are clearly identifiable? And do you see changes in the last years? Um, so I'm not a believer in economic modes, actually. I think that they're, they're rare. And the ones that do have moats, um, the market recognizes it and gives them premium pricing. And I think the world is changing more and more quickly, either from a technology standpoint, there are disruptor companies showing up all of the time. So we're very focused on finding highly intelligent companies that are the best in class in their sector and recognize how uncertain the world is and are flexible and nimble. And I, to me, I think being a great operator and reacting to changing environments uh, is the ultimate economic moat, um, as opposed to some kind of reg regulatory, for example, pr protection that companies might have. So, yeah, Could you maybe name one or two of your top holdings and why do you like them so much? Sure. So one of the themes, I think, in the companies that we own is uh, many of them are quite good at making acquisitions. And the reality is that most public companies are not good at acquisitions. And so I think maybe because of the, of the background of uh, myself and my partners, uh, both in mergers and acquisitions and then in private equity, we're maybe pretty good at identifying the few that are good at acquisitions. So for example, our second largest holding today is a Canadian company which operates all throughout North America in the specialty food area. And they've done an amazing job over the many years, we've owned it probably for 15 years now, of um, uh, creating value through acquiring specialty niche brands in the food industry, uh, both in Canada and the States. Um, and so uh, we, we met a management team that identified long-term trends in food and consumer behavior. Uh, they've been very disciplined. They've created a lot of shareholder value. As an example, uh, since we've owned it, they have uh, compounded returns for their shareholders at, at about 25% a year. Um, and so in a sense, that, that portfolio activity that I described We've somewhat struggled to, to do better than that. We have, we've earned about 35% annualized returns in that position, but, um, but just a buy and hold in that company has been really terrific. How concentrated is, concentrated is your portfolio? Uh, well, it's interesting that, so with the minimum of 25 holdings, but as I've described, they're nowhere near equal weight. So uh, typically, and I looked at this just the other day, The top three holdings might be 20, between 25 and 30 percent. Uh, the top five holdings typically have been, over the years, 35 to 40 percent. The top 10 holdings have always been more than 50 percent of the portfolio. So think of it as a, I almost think of it as a normal distribution of 25 or today 27 holdings. Uh, that range from the 10% I mentioned all the way down to 1% or a half a percent. Do you have a certain geographical focus? So in terms of where the companies operate, we, we really don't. Uh, but the geographical focus, if you think of where mind and management is, uh, for the first uh, many years of our life, um, our attitude was we're based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, before we start looking anywhere else, let's, let's identify the, all of the companies in Canada that we think are ones that we might want to own. So we, we look for highly intelligent organizations, as I've described, that are nimble, uh, honest, uh, good governance, and importantly, focused on their shareholders. And to find those companies, 
uh, it's not, there isn't a screen you can run. You have to meet the companies. You have to talk to lots of people. So think of it as for the first 10 or 12 years of our life, we focus just in Canada. We don't own basic resource companies, so no oil and gas or mining companies ever. And, and then once we felt we had done our job in Canada about 10 years ago, we started doing the same thing in the US. Uh, we're very focused on uh, what I'd call the mid-cap space, so one to two billion market cap at the small side, 25 billion or so market cap at, at the upper band. And we're still in that multi-year process in the US of trying to identify the uh, uniquely, rarely uh, rem remarkable companies. If you look at uh, stocks from Canada and US, do you see some differences in the management um, behavior generally, or is it similar? It's interesting. When it comes to the companies, there is no difference. Um, I mentioned the, the specialty food company, that uh, pr Premium Brands, which is headquartered in Vancouver. Because they st they're headquartered in Vancouver, when they went public, they raised money in Toronto. If they were slightly south and were headquartered in Seattle, they would have raised, they would have gone public in, in the US. So we don't see any difference between um, Canadian head office companies and US head office companies. Um, there is, however, a difference in the stock market. So the, um, we find that in the US, and I don't know all the reasons, there's a more vicious reaction uh, in the market to short-term news and events. And, um, and so maybe it's a cultural thing, maybe it's the size of the U.S. capital market. Um, but we actually find that element of the U.S. market attractive because of the fact that we have this, uh, if I can call it, an active o overlay on top of a buy and hold foundation. If you're analyzing a company, what role does the history and the culture of the company play in your assessment? Uh, they're, they're huge. I mean, so we think it takes um, a long time to really understand a company. We don't have any industry specialization. Um, so we try to identify that, as I've described, that uniquely well-managed company within an industry with the belief that um, through management's eyes over time, we will learn about the industry that they're in. But culture is absolutely critical. Um, you know, for example, to use the the, uh, the the food company as an example, over the years as I've spoken to different uh, entrepreneurs who've sold their food business into premium brands and into what they describe as the premium culture in the ecosystem, uh, I have never heard a single one of those entrepreneurs complain. They've always raved about the culture and how much help uh, joining, in effect, the premium team has been to their division or to, to their company. So it's something that we're constantly monitoring. Uh, it's not always easy to assess from the outside, but um, if you take the time, you have lots of conversations, you do, you do learn over time. So as an example, uh, we always go to the annual meetings of our companies, and um, very few shareholders actually do go to the annual meetings because not a lot happens at the annual meeting in the, in the sense of content. Uh, but what you do have at the annual meetings typically is half the room is management, but not senior management only, but mid-level managers. And it's a great opportunity for us to, to have conversations with people that we don't typically converse with. Most of the time we're talking to the CEO and the CFO and very senior management of the companies we invest in. So how long does it take for you, if you discover a company, to invest? It really varies. Um, sometimes you meet a company and you realize this is remarkable, this is the real thing. And so it's immediately on our list of a company that we, that we might want to own if it's cheap. Then we start doing our valuation work, and that can take time um, to get to know the company. So I'd, I'd say probably the quickest we've ever invested from identifying it as a, as a company that we might want to own to then doing the valuation work is probably half a year. Often it takes longer than that. Um, and then, of course, there are most examples. Uh, we've identified a great company. We do the valuation work. And we conclude it's a great company, but it's trading at a great price. But then we continue to follow it. And uh, with the belief that 
sooner or later, every company falls out of favor in the public market. And, and if that happens, then it gives us a chance to add it to the portfolio. How do you generate ideas? Um, we speak to a lot of people. In fact, probably the most common way that we, if I can use the US market as, as, uh, as, as an example, um, we don't actually look at what other, who, what other shareholders are invested in companies. We've never really looked at that. We have lots of conversations with, uh, with the sell side analysts, but not at the large bulge bracket investment banks, but at the more regional research focused firms. Uh, and those analysts often have um, been in covering their sector for their entire career. They have high quality views on the companies that they, that they follow. They've known them for a long time. And that's extremely valuable for us to have those conversations with the analysts and really get context on, on the different companies. And we'll often, we'll often tell this analyst, saying, this is what we're looking for. And, and many times they'll say, oh, well, if that's what you're looking for, there's only one company that I cover that you should really spend time on. So that's one example of how we identify companies. We go to conferences. One of our largest holdings today is a, is a US company called SS&C Technologies. And um, one of my partners went to a conference, listened to the founder CEO speak for half an hour, followed him into what are called breakout sessions, uh, spent another half an hour with him, and came back to Toronto and said to me, we really have to look at this company. And we did, and, um, and as I say, it's today our fourth largest holding in the, in the fund. So th those are a couple of examples of how we, how we find our companies. Uh, we're not rushing it. Um, in, in 21 years, we've owned only 100 different companies. So the changing in the companies doesn't happen that often. And it wouldn't bother me if uh, for the next five years we, we didn't find another company. We have in our, in our main fund 27, I think, remarkable companies. And, uh, and I have no intention of not owning them for the next many years. The only reason we won't own one of those companies is if uh, either they get taken over, which happens once in a while, but more commonly, they simply rise in price to the point where we don't think it's attractive enough to be in the portfolio. Yeah, uh, you said you like to invest in um, companies from all sectors. Um, is it maybe one uh, sector or one geog geography where at the time now it's easier to find good companies? When I almost turn it around and say that um, you know there are times that an industry loses its sense and uh, becomes uninvestable, and if I, um, one example for 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 me would be what is called the specialty pharmaceutical industry. So, one area that we would never spend time on is in, in drug discovery or biotech. Um, it's not something that I'm comfortable with for a, a, a host of reasons. I mentioned that we don't look at basic resource companies. But I, years ago, found the specialty pharmaceutical space very attractive. That's at the other end of the drug industry, more ma mature products. Um, and we found a, a Montreal company called Paladin Labs, found a run that was remarkable, and we owned it for years, did very well. We also found a company in the US called Warner Chilcott, Uh, based in New Jersey, and uh, that was also a very well-managed company. Those companies both were acquired by uh, firms like Valiant and, and Endo, uh, and the industry, it felt as though it just went crazy in terms of the prices they were paying for products and companies, and then the actions they took after the fact. And so that industry became uninvestable for us, uh, and we sold out of all of those positions. Um, that may change at some point in the future. So it's, um, there are a few industries I, I don't like. I've mentioned a couple, but overall, for us, it, it's about the company. There has to be a company that has figured out how to run circles around their competitors in a good way. And if we can identify that company, as I said earlier, we, we will learn about the business through that company. If you look for value, what are your key metrics and how do you define them? Uh, we define value only one way, the present value of the cash flows. So for each of our companies, uh, we use a discount rate ranging from 8.5% to 
which is a little bit of, to do with the size of the business and, and the riskiness of the business. Um, and then we're, we look at the present value of cash flows. And we create a large financial model for each of our companies and, uh, and apply a discounted cash flow basis. So uh, I can't tell you often what PE multiple our companies are trading at, but I can tell you how much they're trading below the, our view of, 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 of intrinsic value. Uh, and that's, that's the only metric we think about. And also, I don't want to rely upon the public market to see what we think we see. So it's important that the companies we own have strong cash flow, have strong balance sheets, and are open and willing to repurchase and cancel shares if, they're, if their company share price is trading well below um, their estimate of their intrinsic value. Yeah, uh, many people say that markets are getting more efficient, so at least less inefficient. So maybe that changes also your uh, forward returns at Turtle Creek. Um, what if your your best guess on your future returns? Which range would you have in mind? So I, I actually think the opposite about markets. I think that markets are becoming less efficient. And if you think about the, 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 the changes in the market, one thing that's never changed and I don't think ever will change is human nature. The short-termism that many people uh, are sub, sub, subject to. And um, so that focus on short-term results and overreacting uh, ha hasn't changed. If anything, it's gotten worse because we're inundated with information and um, very few people step back and think ref reflectively in longer term. And then if you think of all of the other uh, changes in the market, the increase in passive investing, uh, which uh, is fine for a lot of people. A lot of people should just own the index uh, without trying to pick stocks. But as more and more people are doing that, that's a component of the market that is not, um, is simply not uh, doing the work. And then there are features like uh, people back testing and using big data and uh, momentum to try to find a, a flaw in the market. And I think that's driving larger and larger share price movements at times. So um, I define efficiency as lack of, lack of share price fluctuations. Because if you pull up a stock chart of any company over the last, over a one or two, two year period, and you look at it, a rational person would say the true business value of that company hasn't changed that much, does not fluctuate that much. And so um, we're, 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 we're excited about the opportunity to take advantage of those overreactions. In terms of what our returns will be going forward, if you'd asked me that 21 years ago, I would never have said I think we can earn 20% plus returns. I won't say it now. I don't believe it. But I do think that our approach over the long term, we'll do better than the market. Um, I do think that, you know, I think we can get into double digit returns on a compounded basis. We've written about that in some of our materials. If you step back and think about the, the equity market over the long term, I think nominal returns are nine or nine and a half percent. Um, so I think we can outperform the market. But, um, but again, our approach is to try to de-risk the portfolio, not to reach for higher returns. To sum the interview up, what are your sources of your 22% performance? Well, I think, I think the sources are um, owning above average companies at below average valuations. I mean, it really, in a nutshell, better companies that on their own are um, creating value for their shareholders, and then that reacting activity, that, that uh, willingness to gleefully buy more stock as something's getting cheaper and cheaper. And it's interesting, in the early years, I used to say to my partners, if you aren't excited about the idea that if the stock is down 15 or 20 percent, that you want to buy a lot more, then you probably don't, you, you probably own too much today. And so that thought process has informed how we size each of our holdings at a whole variety of prices. And um, so I think, it's, I think it's a combination of above average companies, but then taking advantage of what the public market serves up in terms of, at times, 
ir irrational price action. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.